I'm Cindy Kelly from the Atomic Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. And it is May 2nd, 2013 in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I have with me Herb Detke. Now, could we start by Herb? You're saying your full name and spelling it. Full name. Full name. Herbert Walfred Depke, H-E-R-B-E-R-T. W A L F R E D D E P K E. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Now, we're just going to start with a simple question, Mike. <clears throat> Can you tell us, you know, what's your birthday, if you don't mind disclosing that, and then a little bit about the circumstances, where you were, and then you can roll into your story. I was born February 23rd, 1935, in Danville, Illinois. That is, the, um, that is the home place of my father and my mother. <clears throat> um, are we talking now about... Sure, you can talk, tell us what their names were and what they okay. did. Okay. <clears throat> my father's name was Herbert Frederick Depke, so I'm not a junior, so they called me Herbie. Uh, my mother's name was Margaret Louise Nigren Depke. Um, World War II came, prior to, prior to World War II, my dad built his own home. He finished it in about 1940. So we lived in, in the home he built in 1940, 1941, 1942. When, when, the, when, when the war effort came along, he was a little bit too old to, to go into the service. Was, was and and had uh, he had um, uh, some teeth problems. He graduated from the University of Illinois, so he was able to to uh, apply for a, a military um, 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 officer's um, what do you call it? Um, he he could become a military uh, officer in in the military, and. He applied for the Navy, but the Navy wouldn't take him. Now, he, like many other people, in his, men in his position at that time, felt they had to do something for the war effort. So he left his business with his father and, and uh, took a job about 35 miles south east of Danville at a plant owned by, operated by, by uh, the DuPont Company that made RDX um, um, explosives. Um, while he was, that was in about 1941. In late 1942, he was asked to transfer to Hanford, Washington. I don't think it was Hanford at the time. They didn't have a name for it. But to Washington State for, with, with the, with the uh, um, uh, DuPont Company, and he accepted. In doing that, he sold the home, put mother and I in uh, with, with uh, her, her oldest brother and in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, the early spring of 1943, Dad drove from Danville, Illinois to, to uh, Pasco, Washington. Um, Another man from Danville went with him, or more. There were at least five families from Danville who, who worked for, for, um, for, um, for the same, for, for, I'm sorry. DuPont. For, for, du, for DuPont in, in India, Indiana, who also went to, to uh, Washington. In, in the early spring of 1943, Dad drove to his new job in southeastern Washington, probably to Pasco. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm sure that that's, that's where his immediate destination was. At least one other Danville man went with him. There were five Danville men who eventually went to to Pasco, Hanford, Richland, uh, and, and so I don't know which 
which one I might have gone with him. I just rem that's just my memory that somebody went with him. Uh, when he got there, of course, his first uh, concern was to find housing for Mother and I so that we could come, come live with him. There wasn't any housing. And um, um, sometime between the time he got there and the summer of 1943, um, he, was, he could not find housing of his own, but a f co-worker of his um, and his wife invited him to have Mother and I come live with them, which we did. Uh, their name was Ruthie and Reggie Doss. And uh, Dad, was, uh, Dad was in the expediting department, and Reggie Doss was also in the expediting department. We, uh, we moved in with them in, 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 pro in probably late June 1943. Mother and I took the train from, from Chicago to Spokane, Washington. Uh, Dad and the Dosses uh, drove to Spokane and picked us up. Um, and, and took us, and now this was from Richland, picked us up and took us back to Richland. It was probably, if I, best I remember, in noontime or in the afternoon, we got to Richland and immediately encountered a dust storm. So that was my first memory of Richland, is a tremendous dust storm that you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. We stopped at the grocery store on the way to the to the to our new home, and I uh, got out of the car and walked to the grocery store and right, ran right straight into a fence and gave myself a bloody nose. Was this because you couldn't see? Couldn't see, absolutely could not see. It was a it was a, a, two, a two by six on on uh, on uh, um, rebars that they had as a, as a fence uh, in, in front of the, uh, the grocery store. And I walked right into it, and it was just exactly the height of my nose. <laughs> so that's my first memory of Richland. From there, we went home, and I believe that, you know, that we couldn't have, couldn't have been more than a half an hour or less by the time we got, we got to the house, and the, and the storm was gone because I, I remember it being clear. And uh, that's my first memory of, uh, of, of Richland. Um, oh, that's great. From there, um, okay, of course, this is summertime. Um, I, the, the, my, my next memory is, <clears throat> my next memory is uh, getting a haircut in Richland. Now, we're, our home, uh, uh, I checked it on a map, our home was about two and two-tenths miles from what I'm calling downtown Richland. Downtown Richland would be where the, where the, um, where the, I believe there was... The John Dam Plaza is? The uh, right, main right, square? right, yeah. where, where, where the, the, uh, the, the uh, theater, eventually was. There was no theater in 43, that was in 44. <laughs> but at any rate, um, I walked from home to, to what I'm calling downtown Richland by myself. I'm, a, I'm about eight years old. It was a very straight um, uh, route, so you know, I didn't get lost or anything like that. But I got to the, to the, to the um, to, to the, the um, barbershop, <coughs> and I wanted a short haircut, and I didn't know what to call it and what to tell them, but they cut my hair exactly the way I have my hair now, very short, and I never had short hair. It, as I said, it was in summer, very hot, and walking back home, I got a sunburn on the top of my head, and mosquito bites. And that's my second memory of, of Richland. Um, of course, I remember the house very well. It was, it's called, as I know now, a B home. That was a duplex, one-story duplex. We lived on the, on the, as you faced it, on the right side. 
Uh, I remember the layout of the, of the house very well. I remember the, the basement. Yeah, for some reason, I have a particularly good memory of the basement. And there was an area there to, to, to store uh, kindling wood to, to start fires because it was a coal-fired furnace. Now, when we were first there, it was summer, but winter did finally get there. And, and I, I remember the kindling. I do not remember where the coal was, and I don't remember ever doing anything with the coal-fired furnace, uh, like bringing the, the uh, clinkers out. You know, that had to be done daily. And whether we spread them in the backyard or what we did, I don't know. There was no, absolutely no um, grass anywhere, none whatsoever, any place. You could not see grass. Because this is, you know, right out in the desert, brand, all brand new. <clears throat> the next thing I remember is I, I started the, 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 th third, the third grade in, in, in Richland. And there was a choice of, of going in the morning or the afternoon. Uh, I don't know whether, I, whether it was a choice or whether they just gave you the, the deal. But mine was in the morning, and I had to get up very early. It was dark. I don't know whether it was 5 or 6 o'clock, but we got, got on a bus and went to school. Um, the, the building we went to school was, was not a schoolhouse type of thing. There was a big room with long, uh, a, a long uh, um, uh, like a folding tables, like, you know, the three by six, whatever. And we just sat around those tables. Now, my memory is just one snapshot of that. I had to have gone there from, from, from the fall of, two, of, of 1943 through the spring of 1944, but I don't remember anything other than the first time the bus took me home and I got off of the bus and the bus was about two blocks from my home as the best I can remember and when I got off of the bus I looked around and all of the houses are identical and I have no idea which one is mine and I don't know I guess I found my mama <laughs> because <laughs> here I am but but that was scary. And that's probably one of the biggest memories I have of, of Richland, being scared getting off the school bus. There was no other, no other um, um, public transportation in 1943. The men, you know, like my dad had his car, but he had to drive from Richland to Hanford and back every day. So mother didn't have a car. So, so, you know, you walked if you wanted to go someplace, and I have no idea what Mother did all day. I've always wondered what in the world she could have done. In the fall of 1943, school started. I began the third grade in, in, in Richland, Washington, and, and uh, the, 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 uh, the plan was to have ch children Go in, some children go in the morning and some go in the afternoon. I was assigned the morning classes, and I don't know how early it was, but it was dark when we when I got up and dark when when I got on the school bus. So I saw I suppose maybe it was like seven o'clock till noon, something like that. I I'm, I can't remember, but the school bus took us to a building. The building was not like a school building. It was probably temporary. I don't. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, the room we were in in school was was um, um, it's almost industrial, and and there was there were a series of of, uh, of um, like folding tables, uh, two and a half, three feet wide by six feet long, um, and and we just sat around the around around the table. I do not recall any class material. Uh, in fact, uh, I have uh, I have a um, a, a memory um, um, 
uh, snippet of, of what I've just, just said, and I don't remember ever even going back again. But the first day when I returned, was returned home on the school bus, I got out of the school bus, they dropped me off, they apparently knew where to, where to stop for me. I got off the school bus and all of the houses were the same. And I had no idea which one was mine and it scared me to death. And apparently I found my way home. I don't know how. That's the story. Um, the house itself was, was uh, called a, uh, a um, um, in, in the Richland vernacular, a B house, which is a, 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 a one-story duplex. I can remember the, 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 uh, the, when, you, when you went into the front door of the house, Straight ahead was the dining room, to the right was the living room, and then to the right of that was, were, were, were two, be two bedrooms, a two-bedroom house, one bath, uh, a small kitchen. Um, the, from the back door, you could go straight into the basement. Um, the basement was, for some reason, interesting to me, and I can still see that basement was a concrete floor. Uh, there was a, a place where they piled um, um, kindling wood to start the fire in the coal-fired furnace. Uh, of course, being a coal-fired furnace, there had to be coal somewhere. I don't remember it. Just don't. That's not in my. That's not a part of my memory. <clears throat> um, when when winter came, of course, I uh, having having experienced uh, coal-fired furnaces in in homes. I know that the clinkers had to be removed from the, from the furnace and taken out. I don't remember what we did with that. There was no, no um, um, grass anywhere, no trees, no grass. I don't believe in, in, in 1943 there were even street signs. I don't think street signs had been, been put up yet. Um, the streets were, were quite straight, north, south, east, west, like I was used to in the Midwest, so it wasn't that difficult to get around. I do not remember any friends at all at any time until, until 1944 when, when, when Dad uh, got a, 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 a unit for ourselves. And when we lived over near, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Until we lived over near the uh, river. Uh, there was a little boy a couple of years younger than me across the street and that's the only other child I remember. And I have no idea what I did with myself all day. There's no, no nothing in my memory bank that tells me what, what in the world I would have done. Was your mother at home then? Yes, she was. Now, she was a, a uh, house cleaning slave, and when when the when the uh, dust storms came, of course the windows were closed, but the dust came into the house even with closed windows. And I can remember, uh, in, especially in the window sills, there was like a quarter inch of this extraordinarily fine dust, and of course it was all over the house on this, all surfaces. And uh, that kept her busy. I don't know how often there were dust storms, but I remember quite a few. And, uh, but I don't remember ever being out in a dust storm except for the first day we, we, uh, we went into Richland. A fateful day. Fateful day, yes. Spluttered my nose all over my face. So did your mother talk about Richland later after you No. Say my mother. My, uh, my, my mother did not. My mother didn't, did not talk about, about, uh, about Richland. Um, uh, the people we lived with, the Dosses, um, uh, um, Ruthie Doss got pregnant. Um, um, 
uh, maybe in, in the fall of 1943, that word was never used then. That's a, that was a dirty word then. People didn't use words like that. Pregnant. And I'm only eight years old. I'm not sure I know what's going on anyway. But at any rate, the, the, the reason I bring it up is because at that point, they were not going to have room for us to stay with them, and we were going to have to do something else. We, uh, Mother and I, as best I can remember, went back to Danville Christmas of 1943. I don't know, maybe she was a lonesome for home. I can't think of any other reason. We came back to, to Richland. I know we came back to Richland. We lived in that house um, uh, certainly in the spring of 1944 because Dad took a long weekend. We drove to Moscow, Idaho, which is not really not very far from 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 Hanford. We drove we drove from Richland through the Hanford grounds. <clears throat> I can remember uh, the the uh, going through the uh, um, they they stopped us. Word. To the reservation? The, security area? Secur the, the security to, to, get, to get into Hanford. And what I remember is the main thing they wanted to discover was whether or not we had a, a camera. Cameras were just absolutely no, no, no. And, and, and as best I can remember, we didn't have, but they did search the car before we went into, in, in, in through Hanford. We drove through Hanford, out the north end of Hanford, across the Columbia River on an old iron bridge, I can remember it quite well, and then drove northeast to, uh, to Idaho. My dad had a fraternity brother who was in charge of, of, the, uh, of, uh, of uh, music, the music department at the University of Idaho. And we spent Easter weekend there, so I kn that's how I know exactly when, when it was. Sometime shortly after that, Mother and I went back to Danville because the Dosses needed the space for the ensuing baby. <clears throat> Mother and I remained in Danville until I finished school, the third grade, in Danville and came back to, to to Richland uh, in the summer of 1944. <clears throat> um, I remember by then there was public transportation buses, and I think it was five cents, if I remember correctly, five cents to ride the bus to town. <clears throat> there, there was no, there was no, um, um, postal service, you had to go downtown and you had a post office box and you went down there and picked up the mail. One day, mother and I took the bus downtown, quote unquote, to pick up the mail. And on the way back home on the bus, mother is, 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 is looking at, at the mail and one, one of the pieces of mail was from from the Navy Department, and <clears throat> she opened it, and Dad got his his Navy um, a commission, and I can remember she cried, because you know, Dad's going to war. So almost immediately after that, we we left Richland. Dad um, um, went into naval Navy training, naval officers training, <clears throat> happened to be in Tucson, Arizona. But the important thing to, 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 for, to me to, to recognize is that Dad went into the Navy, trained for the invasion of Japan. Now, he had been working in the Manhattan Project. The invasion of Japan had it transpired. My dad trained as a, as a 
port director. Now, a port director is a fancy name for the guy that goes on the beach and directs the invasion. He wouldn't have lasted long in that war. So the atomic bomb saved his life. And that is the irony of the story. <clears throat> That's great. What, how far along did he get in the training? Was he actually on board ship or was he waiting mm -hmm. assignments? Remember? He left, <clears throat> he left for overseas about a week after VJ Day. He wound up in, in, um, in um, Okinawa as um, occupation force. And um, he was there for less than a year and uh, uh, came home in 1945. So VJ Day was September 14. Yeah. So he came home in de end of December. No, he was in, in, in he was in, um, Dad was oh, in. Oh, okay, so he came home Dad, in 46. I'm sorry, that's correct, 46. He was, he was in, in, uh, in Okinawa um, through, um, through early 40, 1946. I think he came home in January of 1946. Oh. The first thing that I have to admit is that as a child, the war, had, the war pre pre presented no real fear, and death had no real meaning. So, so us kids just had fun with the thing. You know, we, we had uh, played guns and played war and all these things, and it was just a wonderful thing to go to the movie and see the, the, um, the um, newsreels. The newsreels. And, and oh, there are the tanks and the planes and people getting shot and dying and all that. That was just a lot of fun. It had no real, no meaning in the real, in, in the real world to us. Um, as, far as, as far as toys and so forth, we had only what, what was available to us before the war because during the war, toys were not made. You know, everything went into the war effort. So what little we had was wood and cardboard. There was no plastic in those days, so we didn't, didn't know plastic. Um, and and, and so, so a lot of times we made our own toys. You know, we took an old broomstick and made a gun out of it. That's the kind of thing we did. Um, it didn't, it didn't, uh, Kick the can as a as a as a game, um, you know. We still had we still had cans, but but we didn't. We just you know there weren't any there weren't any toys made whatsoever, and uh, when Christmas came, it w what 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 toys we got were either wood or cardboard, and uh, it didn't bother us any. We had fun. We were running around outdoors and playing catch with a ball or what whatever you know kids did then. Um, I suppose they still do that now, but I'm not sure. Um, but w when it comes to my memory of, of what I did in, in, uh, in Richland, I just don't really have much of a memory of playing. Um, it, 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 it's almost all snapshots of memory. I don't have much. Um, um, in 1944, when we lived near the the, um, the Columbia River, I can remember the Columbia River was less than a block from our house, uh, maybe a half a block, um, and and we would walk over to the to the river's edge. I remember that well. Um, um, did you go swimming in the river? No. Um, no, we didn't. Um, I do remember that in 1944, I believe there was a, was a, a um, that they built a, 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 a swimming pool in what I call downtown. And I don't remember whether I ever swam in it or not. But I do remember, I, I also remember the, 
the, uh, the movie theater in what I'm calling downtown Richland. I can remember going to the movie. Um, I can remember uh, the, the, I can remember a, a specific movie. It was a war movie about about a spy in in Germany. Um, the the movie theater had a had an upstairs balcony in the back that that was that had a glass enclosure so that ladies could take little children and babies up there and it wouldn't be noisy. That I remember. Um, but um, I don't know what I did with my time. Um, in in uh, in the summer of uh, in the summer of uh, 1944, just prior to to Dad getting his Navy um, commission, uh, I I went to a YMCA camp outside of Spokane. Um, it is still it is still active. It's still active. Uh, you can find it on the on the internet. But I do remember, I do remember that uh, that that camp. It was quite dramatic. The the the, uh, the scenery. It was on a on a big lake, and I do remember swimming in that lake. Um, that's um, that's about everything I remember about about you know what I did as a kid in in Richland. You talked about the trip to Moscow, Idaho, with your dad and, yes. and mom. Um, do you remember any other trips? <clears throat> did you take outside? No, outside? that was the only one. But you do remind me that that, uh, of course, in the war years, many things were were um, rationed. rationed. <laughs> and one one of them was liquor. And and uh, they could get one bottle of liquor a month, and I can remember we drove to, to. Um, Pasco. No, no, this side of Pasco. Kennewick. I can remember we drove to Kennewick, monthly, so they could buy their bottle of liquor, and and several people would go, <laughs> and. They would also stop at a tavern and go in, you know, have a beer, whatever they did. And it was illegal for a minor to go in, so I had to sit in the car. So there's a there's a little memory. Um, as a child, of course, time is so much longer than than an adult's time, and so is space. <clears throat> I can remember. The, the, the drive from Richland to, to, to Kennewick seemed very long to me, very long drive. That I can remember. <clears throat> I, we went to Pasco once or twice, but I don't know why. <clears throat> Maybe just for a drive, I don't know. Um, but, but Kennewick was a long, long ways away. <laughs> just, you know. Can you tell us about the car that your family had? That was unusual, wasn't it? To have a car. Um, well, of course, <clears throat> my dad drove the family car out there, and that that was the car. It was a. It happened to be a four-door Chrysler. It was a big car. Uh, I and I remember it well. I have a picture of it. Um, um, I don't know at this point uh, mentioned the license plate on that car. Uh, in in 1945, my my dad and mother and I were in Danville, Illinois, our home home city, um, and there is a photograph of my dad in his navy uniform with my mother, and and the back of that car is in the photo. And the license plate is Washington, 1942. That confused me for years and years. I said, Dad must have been there in 1942. What is, what, what is wrong with the story? Uh, when, when, uh, w when I finally was able to read, read um, uh, Grove's book, um, Now It Can Be Told, and, and I discovered that, that 
things didn't start there until 1943. I said, what, what is this 1942 thing? I finally remembered really fairly recently that because of the war, during the war years, they did not make license plates after about 1941 or 42. So the 1942 license plate was the only plate available to him, and that's why it was a 1942 license plate, because metal was not used to make licenses, you know, because of the war. So Dad, Dad was sworn into the Navy in Spokane, and there is Spokane, Washington, and there I, I, I have the, uh, the, uh, the news article from the Spokane paper. For some strange reason, I can't imagine why the Spokane paper put an article in there that Herbert F. Depke of Richland, Washington uh, was uh, sworn into the United States Navy. Very soon after that, we, uh, you know, uh, Dad was assigned to go to, uh, to uh, Tucson, Arizona to, uh, to, to go to officer's training school. That's 90 days. Now, in World War II, they called them the 90-day wonders. And that's why, in 90 days, they turned a man into an officer. And that's the, that's the story. From, so, so we were in Tucson for 90 days. I started the third grade in Tucson. And from there, we went to, to uh, Port Wainimi in California. And I, we was there for a couple of months. So I went to grade school in, in, in uh, Carpinteria, California, which is about 12 miles south of uh, Santa Barbara. Um, we were there through early 1945. <clears throat> Dad took training in several other places, but finally wound up in Long Beach, um, New York. Uh, I was deposited with my grandparents in Danville, and I went to school, back to school in Danville, Illinois, and uh, Mother went on to Long Beach with Dad. Um, after he was done there, he went to, um, to uh, Seattle, Washington, and uh, shipped up overseas a week after VJ Day. And um, he, he went to, uh, he went to um, Okinawa as a, as a, um, I'm getting to As part of the occupation forces? He went to Okinawa as part of the occupation forces and was there about, about one year, a little less than a year and uh, was, uh, came, came home in 1946. So dad, dad trained for the invasion of Japan. Fortunately, that invasion did not happen. Dad, dad trained as a port director. Now that sounds like a real fancy job, but what it really was was a man who, who was, state, was, 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 was went on shore and directed the invasion. He obviously wouldn't have lasted long, and therefore I must point out that the atomic bomb really saved his life. So here's a man who worked in the Manhattan Project and wound up having the atomic bomb save his life. Uh, this is a photo of the, the, the of the Dosses who we who we lived with in 1943 and early 1944 in Richland. Reggie Reginald Doss and Ruthie Ruth Doss. Ruth was became pre as, uh, became pregnant in in 1940 late 1943, which which caused Mother and I to have to go back home to Danville, Illinois, and this picture was, was in 19, taken in 1952 um, when, when uh, mother and dad and my future wife and I visited them. My, my father, Herb Depke, my mother, Do Margaret, and my future wife, Pat, and I uh, visited the Dosses in, in, uh, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky in 1952. And the little girl, who was the 
who was the baby to be born uh, was, was there. And she's in the, in the photograph. Was any other members of your extended family who were involved in World War II that might have been affected by this atomic bomb? Not directly. My, my mother's, my mother's uh, brother was in the Navy. Two brothers were in the Navy. Uh, but one, uh, one um, was in uh, the South Pacific. And uh, the other one uh, um, it did, uh, was, was uh, stationed in the United States the whole time. Um, nothing, nothing really that involved the uh, Manhattan Project. The, the Manhattan Project or, or our, our um, uh, life in, in, uh, in, in Richland, Washington was never discussed to my knowledge uh, later in, in uh, back home in Danville later in life. I, I don't remember it ever being talked about. When you were alone with your parents, did you ever say, Mom and Dad, can you tell me what you were doing? Or did no, they... I did not. There was not, I don't think it was, it was particularly unique to my family. There just wasn't a lot of family talk. Certainly not in my family and not in a lot of families, certainly of that time that I knew. Uh, to just it just that kind of uh, of uh, th that kind of uh, conversation just didn't happen. I don't know when I realized that Dad had anything to do with it with the atomic bomb or even the Manhattan Project until much later in life, um, when I was probably an adult and was was reading. Uh, about these things, and I said, and then I would just simply say, "Oh, I was there," you know, <laughs> what a big deal. Uh, but uh, but I don't. Dad, Dad never talked about it. He really never never talked even about his Navy experiences. So so th there was never really any discussion. Um, I I remember probably when we were driving to to um, Moscow, Idaho, which would have been in the spring of 1944, when we, st I can remember stopping for lunch, and we were in, 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 a, uh, uh, in, in, in a little restaurant in some little town, and, and I can remember Dad saying something about, oh, it has something to do with the atom, and he whispered it. Because you know you weren't supposed to say anything loud that might, might, you know that the enemies my enemy might hear, and that's the only time. And I don't even know that I uh, that I knew what an atom was, but I remember that very distinctly. So, so here is in nineteen that spring of nineteen forty four is what I'm talking about. And, and he has an inkling that, that, some, that, that some, whatever's going on has something to do with atoms. He also said, I just remembered, he also said the output at Hanford is a little trickle of something like water. And I've never understood that because, because, uh, because that is not what was really the output in, in, in Hanford, as I understand the process, I don't know, I don't know, he might have seen something or heard something that indicated to him that it was a, some kind of a liquid, a fluid, that, that was the end result of the process, and obviously that was not the case. Um, but it was, might have been, because actually, the plutonium was extruded, and they had to then put it in a metallic form. Yes. So the Might idea of a trickle, though, it was just a tiny yeah. bit of product for all of the things that went into Hanford. That's, Maybe that was a That's possible. Form. That's possible. Well, I just remembered him saying, remember him, him, him saying that. And of course, that makes me think, you know, that the, the secrecy was supposed to be so extremely you know, everything was extremely guarded. Yet here's a man, you know, saying he thinks he knows a little bit. And that's surprising. 
You know, I, I can't imagine that, that, the, that secrecy was, was uh, as good as they tried to make it. Of course, we know that the Russians knew all along from the, from the uh, spies, and, and uh, I just chuckle when I think about all of the, all of the extraordinary effort that was made in secrecy that I just wonder how secret things were. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, you have to think about 130,000 people. Well, yes. There were three, or maybe there were three dozen spies, but there, that's a tiny fraction of the hundreds of thousands of people. Of course, but the but the Russians knew what we were, <laughs> what we, they had to do. <laughs> and, you know, it's the old story. If you want to keep a secret, you just don't tell anybody. One person is one too many. And uh, I, when, when they talk about uh, Harry Truman did not know this was going on until he became president, I find that hard to believe. Just, it's just uh, rather incredulous, I don't know. So do you think, um, did your mother and father socialize at all? Do you remember them? I don't believe they did. At, at one, one weekend, they went somewhere and left me with, with a, a other, another family from Danville who, who, were, who were in Richland. I have a photograph of, of the, that they gave me of myself on their back porch. And I have often wondered where was it they went for that weekend. You know, they didn't thinking about thinking about the the, the region and and the war time. I can't imagine where they where they went that weekend. I never asked, and so I won't know. That's the only time that I know of that they quote unquote, went out and did something. I don't know. I don't remember. I have often wondered why it is that my, my memory is so limited. Uh, as I've said, um, um, it seems to be snippets or uh, um, just uh, still photographs of certain things that I, that I remember. And then there are long periods of I have no idea. And, and uh, eating a meal. This is rather strange to me. I don't remember ever eating a meal in Richland, Washington. You know, going to a table and having breakfast and dinner, supper, is not part of my memory. Do you, did your dad not come home for dinner? You know, I don't remember that either. I believe that he came home every night from, from Hanford because I, I don't think he had a place there to stay. Uh, I believe that all of the all of the men who worked in Hanford and had homes in Richland drove to Hanford and came home every night. Now that is rather interesting because gasoline was rationed, and we're talking about I don't know what a fifty-mile round trip. I, I can't remember exactly. But it's something like that. It's maybe 25 miles or so from, from Richland to Hanford. So, so that's a, a 50 mile, approximately 50 mile round trip, five times a week. That's a lot of gasoline. It's just interesting. I don't, I don't know what it means, you know. So tell me, you said your dad was an expeditioner or an ex expediter. expediter. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know any more about what that job entailed? Expeditors followed up on the purchase of goods. Uh, the only specific thing I can remember is that Dad told me, and this was a number of years later, so, so I'm sorry to say that I, I'd forgotten that he did talk about it later. He said he remembered they lost it was either a railroad car or an entire 
train of stainless steel um, uh, fittings. And they just drove themselves nuts trying to find that car or train. And eventually they discovered it was right there in Hanford all the time. Interesting. That's then, to the best of my memory, that's the only thing that I, that, that I directly know about, about expediting. I've forgotten the number, but I think they had something like 500 miles of track on the site. So it is yeah, well, they, it they lost small. either a car or a train. I don't remember which it was. <laughs> it was right there, <laughs> right under their nose. Well, looking back on, on your family, because obviously you were too young to say you were involved, but you know, your, your father's involvement in the atomic bomb and creating that, how does that make you feel after all these years? Um, <clears throat> I think Tom Brokaw's book, the what generation? The greatest. greatest generation, made me stop and think about that question specifically, and. I don't, in, I don't mean to, to make a, a, a hero out of my father at all. He was typical of the men of the time. <clears throat> he couldn't go directly into service. He could, well, of course, he could. No, he, 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 he couldn't go directly into service. Therefore, he sought what, what, what they call war work. They went to, to factories where they were doing war effort work. When, when he was asked to transfer from, from the Indiana, from the, from the, from the DuPont, Indiana plant to, to Washington, he sold his home that he had just built his, himself by his own labor and, 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 uh, and left that home. And 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 went to went went to Washington to to work as as he was asked to do. Um, I look at that as a pretty big choice to make, you know, a a, 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 a pretty big um, sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah, pretty pretty big pretty big sacrifice, and. And they did those things. Uh, he was not alone. People, that's what people did. You know, they were, um, they were, um, I'm sorry. Uh, Civic minded. Um, patriotic? Patriotic, yeah. They so why don't you? Right. Um, this, this, was, this was the norm for people then. They were patriotic. And uh, they just did what they thought needed to be done. No, no thought, no, you know, they didn't, no, no personal thought. They just did what they thought had to be done. So from that point of view, uh, that, that, that's how I view what, what he and, and, and others I know in Danville, Illinois, along with him, did. They just did what they were asked to do. So when you go back to your high school reunion, your class of 60th high school reunion yeah. coming up, yeah. so will your classmates have similar stories of their parents' involvement in the war, of war effort? Do you imagine? Have you ever talked to them about I this? I have not. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, Do you think that before Tom Brokaw wrote his book, *The Greatest Generation*, there was much appreciation about how remarkable, at least from today's perspective, it seems that um, that generation was? I don't think so. Maybe privately, you know, here and there. Um, um, 
I just remember that, that it was that book that made me look back on it. I knew, I knew that, that Dad had, had uh, like I said, literally he had built that house himself and we had only lived there two years and he sold it and left for uh, unknown, for the unknown. And, uh, um, you know, that, that really gives me pause. I, I, I'm not sure that I understand that kind of thinking. It, uh, well, there wasn't any thinking. It just did it. And so if you were confronted with that choice today? Probably the same thing because, because I was a part of that generation where duty and honor was, you know, that was just came naturally and that was the way it was. So probably so. I wouldn't, have, wouldn't hesitate, no. Did you get wrapped up in any war yourself? Uh, I was in the Navy Reserve for eight years. So that was from 1950 to 1962, but that was because uh, the, the laws of the time said well, that's what you had to do. You had to spend so much time in the military in that time frame. That was uh, 1952 was the beginning or near the end of the Korean War. Uh, there was a Naval Reserve Center in Danville, Illinois, and I joined as a sophomore, as a, as a junior in high school. And uh, our unit was almost called up for the, for the uh, Korean War. I almost decided I'd made a bad choice, <laughs> but it didn't happen. And you just missed the Vietnam War. You were I was out too old for that. Yep. Up. Yep. I missed them all. Yeah. So as a, as a little, little kid, I could look at it and say, well, what fun it was, tanks and airplanes, you know, and then, then later I missed all the opportunities to actually be in the tanks and airplanes. That's the way it goes. I'm not sorry for that. The train, the train trips from Chicago to Spokane will always be some of my best memories. That was a four-day train trip, and and it was just marvelous. I mean, you know, uh, the clickety clack of the trains. You know, today you can't even get a clickety clack on the on the tracks because they're continuous rails. But back then, you had the clickety clack of the of the of the, of the, of the rails, and it was, and and the. The, the, the service uh, for breakfast and dinner and supper, you know, um, everything was very formal and um, it, it was just a wonderful uh, experience. And I had that four times, you know, going back and forth from, from, uh, from, from uh, Washington to Illinois, and that is a really strong memory. So, did you have a, a, a sleeper berth? We did every every every. T there were different kinds, and we had every kind there was. There was a called a roomette, I can remember, and there was a sleeper, and there was a berth, and I, it was something else. We had we experienced each all of them over the various times, yeah. Well, that was, that was great. I, I don't know if there's anything else I should be, or that you'd like to talk about, or. Have well, you been back to Richland? Yes. <clears throat> My wife and I eventually went into the craft instruction book publishing, and this was in the years of, in, in, the, in the mid 70s, when macrame was so big, and we, we did a bi-monthly newsletter called Enjoy Macrame. There was a retired school teacher in Richland, Washington, who became a pen pal with Pat, my wife, and 
on our 20th anniversary, we flew to the West Coast and rented a car and drove to Richland and visited this lady. She lived in, a, in, in, in one of the B houses. And uh, it was very, quite similar. The, pro the, 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 the change was that there was grass every place. <laughs> That's the biggest difference. Now, this was in 1975. So what was the same but without it? Well, the houses. Those houses were still there. Of course, it was much bigger. I mean, you know, I think it was 15,000 when we, when we were there, and I, I don't know what the number was, 100,000, 200,000, what it, what it is in 1975. It was a big, big city. If that was different than the paved roads, yeah, that, that, that causes me to remember that all the roads were, were gravel, you know, when, it, certainly in 43, most of them in 44 were gravel. Um, but we did, did visit Richland again. Yep, that was fun. Did you find your old house? No, because I didn't know where it was. I didn't work that. I hadn't didn't work that until worked that out until recent times, and I only know it approximately. Today, you only know today. approximately. Right, yeah. within a block or two. So, if we dropped you off in a school bus, I'd, I'd have the same. I'd, I'd have the same uh, fever. <laughs> oh dear, that's your lifetime nightmare. Yep, yep my lifetime nightmare would come back. <laughs> <laughs>